Hey, welcome to Family Church. We are a diverse, spirit-filled, life-giving church, healing hearts, building relationships, and developing leaders. My name is Pastor John Mark. I'm so excited that you've connected to our page today. Be sure to grab a notebook, a pen, a paper, your phone, however you want to take notes and get ready for today's message. Amen. Good morning, church. Welcome back to week two on our series, A Conversation About Faith. If you missed last week, I want to strongly encourage you, go back and listen to that great kickoff to the series by Pastor Mike. He talked about someone that you might know as Doubting Thomas and talked about how we often define people by their worst moments, but we see God's faithfulness and we see how God can use us in spite of our doubts. This week, as we continue the conversation about faith, I want to start my message a little bit different. I want to start by teaching a concept that I think really holds together this idea of faith and how it connects with our walk with God. Generally, when I do a message, I try to first talk to the heart and then move up to the head towards conclusion. But today, I want to flip this around. I want to talk to the head and then move down to the heart. So this week, I want to start with this concept known as the underlying principle. Say it with me. Say the underlying principle. I heard, we're going to try, I know it's early, we're going to try that again. Say the underlying principle. And what an underlying principle is, is it's a fundamental concept or idea that serves as the foundation for a system, a theory, or a belief, or a practice. Think of an underlying principle as the foundation on which all other ideas are built. So if this Jenga tower is a bunch of ideas, and by the way, if I dropped this, I would have ended church because it would have been too embarrassing. If this tower is all these ideas, the underlying principle is the table that keeps it all suspended, that holds it all together. Does that make sense to everyone? Good. So now, instead of me trying to explain it more and more and more, why don't we play a game together to better get this concept You didn't know it today, but when you showed up to church, you showed up for a game of Jeopardy! Now I'm going to read a set of phrases, and what I need you to do is I need you to identify the underlying principle that holds up all these ideas together. Ready? Here we go. First statement, hard work beats talent when talent doesn't work hard. That's by Tim Notke. Michael Jordan says, everyone has talent, but ability takes hard work. Next quote by Kobe Bryant, I have nothing in common with lazy people who blame others for their lack of success. Great things come from hard work and perseverance, no excuses. Cristiano Ronaldo says, talent without working hard is nothing. Are you seeing a pattern here? We'll do one more just in case, the person in the back. There is no substitute for hard work. Hard work. Hard work. Hard work. Now the million dollar question is what is the underlying principle or the idea that brings all those quotes together? Yes! Give it up for yourselves. We are a church full of scholars. I want to notify you that you all just won $1 million. Yes, God is good. And I don't know where you went. Pastor Chris is actually going to be paying everyone. So go ahead and message him on Facebook. We see that all these people, they lived different lives. Thomas Edison was an inventor. Cristiano Ronaldo was a soccer player. Michael Jordan, basketball player, Tim Notke, a coach. But if you were to ask all these people, what is the one thing that you built your careers on, they would say that the underlying principle is hard work. What's crazy about this idea of hard work is it's not something that you can go and buy from the store. You can't say, honey, can you grab me a bottle of hard work? I gotta, I gotta mow the lawn. You can't say, man, I'm going to go to a tree and pick some hard work because I need to get this essay done, right? That hard work is not something that we can hold in our hands, but the effects of it are visible. Hard work is not something that I can just grab, 
but the effects are visible. In other words, hard work which cannot be seen gives life to something that can be seen like a career. And according to the Bible, faith operates the exact same way. Faith is not something that I can grab a hold of in terms of I can't go to the store and buy some faith. I can't say, Pastor Mike, I, I need some faith. Can, I'm going to Venmo you $20. Can you send me a box of faith? But we see that in the Bible that faith which is unseen can give you visible results. In other words, faith can be like an underlying principle. In Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says, Now faith is the assurance of things to hope for, the conviction of things not seen. Verse 2, Indeed, by our faith, by faith our ancestors, think of Bible heroes, they received approval from God. By faith, we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen, what is visible, is made from things that are not visible. As we're going to go through this chapter today in Hebrews chapter 11, it is all about encouragement. It's about encouraging the reader in their faith. It's supposed to inspire us not to quit in our faith. And we have these two ideas that I want to bring together today. On the one side, we have the idea of faith. And on the other side, we have this idea called the underlying principle. How do these ideas come together? Believe it or not today, these aren't just cool ideas that we can just talk about and go home and say, wow, that was pretty cool. But we see in history that Jesus Christ is the fulfillment and he brings these two ideas together perfectly. There's so many ideas that people have studied that we see when we look at Jesus, it's almost as like they were looking at Jesus through a blurry lens. Listen to a few quotes that are 400, everybody say 400, 400 years before Jesus arrived on the scene. You see, the Greek philosophers, they looked at things like reason, they looked at mathematics, they looked at astrology, they looked at humanity, and they said there has to be an idea that is the underlying principle of creation. They said there has to be something that is the unifying principle. And here's a quote that is 400 years before Jesus. A philosopher named Heraclitus, he said this, he says, everything is in a state of flux. The universe remains in a state of change where the logos, everyone say logos, the logos is the fundamental source and gives order to the world. But it didn't stop there because this is 400 years before Jesus. 200 years go by and they keep developing the idea of the logos. If you've ever heard the word stoic or the word stoicism, the Greek philosophers, this is where we get that word being stoic from. Here's some quotes from the Stoics. They said, the logos doesn't just hold everything together. The logos is the principle that creates the world. All power comes from the logos and all power returns to the logos. The logos is the active force in the universe. So these philosophers were searching for an underlying principle, and what did they name it? They named it the the Logos. And then we fast forward 250 more years, and we get in the Bible the Gospel of John. That's very different from Matthew, Mark, and Luke. John doesn't start with a baby in a manger. There's no talk of a baby in a manger. There's no talk of wise men. There's no talk of fleeing to Egypt. There's no talk of the genealogy of Jesus, but it begins like this. John chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the Logos. Or in the beginning was the Word. And the Logos was with God. And then John pushes it a step further. He says the Logos was God. Then he says in verse 2, he, so now the Logos isn't just an idea. It's a person. He was with God in the beginning. Verse 3, through him all things were made. Without him was made nothing that has been made. Verse 4, in him was life, and that life was the light of all mankind. God is life. Verse 14, John pushes it another step. He says, the Logos became flesh, and he dwelt among us. 
So he's saying the thing that you've all been searching for, this underlying principle that you spent 400 years trying to find, he said that principle stepped down from heaven and was walking among us. He's saying that the logos, the unifying principle of creation, was standing right in front of us, and we have seen his glory. John is making the claim that all of creation rests upon a single person, and that person is Jesus. Jesus Christ, the underlying principle of all of creation. Now watch this and how it connects to faith. The thing that the people were searching for, that the philosophers were searching desperately for, is Jesus Christ. The thing that they were searching for made, was made flesh and dwelt among them. And in our lives, I believe that we are all searching for something. That we're searching for a sense of fulfillment. That we're searching for a sense of purpose that we're searching for the meaning of life. And the reality is, you cannot understand the tower that's standing without first understanding the underlying principle. So in our faith, when we look for where do we place our faith, there is no better foundation than Jesus Christ. The reality is that everybody places their faith in something, but not everybody places their faith in the great underlying principle of creation. If Jesus Christ is the one that upholds everything, then let's be honest, what better place is there for us to place our faith? What better option is there to place our faith? Is it better to place your faith in your job? Some of y'all is like, mm-mm, mm-mm. Is it better to place your faith in things that can change on us, people who change? Or is it better to place our faith and our foundation in the underlying principle? Listen to what Hebrews chapter 1 verse 1 says. It says, long ago, God spoke to our ancestors in many and various ways by the prophets. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by a son whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom he also created the world. He is the reflection of God's glory and the exact imprint of God's very being. Listen to this last verse. And he sustains, he sustains all things by his powerful word. It is the word of God. It is Jesus Christ. It is the logos that holds up everything. You might have heard the song that we sing here that Christ is our firm foundation. He's the rock on which we stand. You might have heard the phrase that Christ is the cornerstone. All these ideas are making it very clear that there is no better foundation for our lives than Jesus Christ. The reality is all of creation is dependent on the logos for his existence. Why is it that the philosophers can look at truth and at the end find Jesus? Because Jesus is in all of creation. And as we look at this idea of faith, now I want to transition from our heads down to our hearts. And I want to ask, okay, so if Jesus is the foundation of everything, then what role do we get to play? Why does Jesus have us here right now? What role do we get to play in our faith? And I need your help in announcing the title of today's sermon. So look at the person next to you and say to them, say, neighbor, faith is the underlying principle of Christianity. What do I mean by that? I mean that faith is the one thing that holds up Christianity. Faith is the one thing that upholds when we see what people in the Bible are doing, that really it comes down to placing their faith in God. And when we truly break this down, we see in Scripture that faith in God is to be the foundation of our lives. And to illustrate this point today, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 11, which is often referred to as the hall of faith. 
And I'm going to go through this rapid fire. So every time I point at you, I need you to say faith nice and loud. All right, let's practice. Faith. Ooh. All right, let's go. Y'all ready? <laughs> Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now faith. is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. Indeed, by faith. our ancestors received approval. By faith. we understand that the worlds were formed where worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen is made from things not visible. Verse 4, by faith. Abel offered to God a more acceptable sacrifice than Cain's. By faith. Enoch was taken so that he did not experience death. Verse 6, and without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And the Pharisees learned this the hard way. They did all the behaviors of following God. They made it clear how much they loved God. They did all these things. And then Jesus shows up, and you know what their underlying principle was? Their own works. Their own ability. Look at what I can do. And Jesus walks on the scene like, <laughs> you think you're special? You think you're special because you can tithe on the salt on your table? He says, you do all of these things, but you don't understand mercy. God is mercy. You don't understand compassion. God is compassion. You don't understand love. God is love. You're acting out all these things, but you're not built on the foundation. They had no faith. Let's keep reading. For whoever would approach him must believe that he exists and that he rewards those who seek him. Verse 8, by, by faith Abraham obeyed when he was called to set out for a place that he was to receive as an inheritance. And he's, this is crazy. He set out from his home not knowing where he was going. Now listen, I'm a pastor. I get paid to be a Christian. And if God said, pack up the U-Haul, I'm going to show you where to go, I'm going to be like, sir, um, that's not how Waze works. You got to give me the address. And while we're there, can I have all the details, please? Because I ain't trying to look crazy. It says that by faith that Abraham left his home. He packed up and he moved everyone based off of a word from God. You see, faith in God is not about having all the details. It's about trusting the one who does. <laughs> faith is not about having all the details. It's about trusting the one who does. And the reality is we understand faith in our lives. We apply it in our lives. This idea of trusting the word that was spoken for example, if you plan on having a barbecue at 6 p.m. and the weatherman says at 8 a.m. when it's sunny that there's going to be torrential downpours tonight. He says there's going to be crazy thunderstorms. What are you going to do in that moment? You're going to cancel your barbecue. Why? Because you trust the word of the person that was speaking. How much more should we trust the underlying principle of all of creation? How much more can we trust God when he speaks? We see with all these Bible heroes that faith is the underlying principle. And this is just up to verse 8. This whole chapter goes on about faith, faith, faith. We just came out of this series on Exodus, and Pastor Mike gave a great message about how the people crossed over on dry land. Listen how the, the author of Hebrews interprets that story. Verse 29, by faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land. But when the Egyptians attempted to do the same, they were drowned. You see, these people who crossed the Red Sea weren't just walking on the ground. They were walking on, on faith. 2 Corinthians 5, 7 tells us, for we walk by faith and not by sight. Can you begin to see how the unseen, how faith can lead to the visible? How faith has an impact directly in our lives? 
And you might say, but yeah, th th those days are gone. The days of the Bible heroes and the, the days of this crazy faith, that, that this thing is gone. That was for back then, but it's not for today. Well, let me give you a, li a little history lesson on our church. Just a few weeks ago, the founders of our church, Pastor Joe and Miss Lynn, they were in town and they were visiting. And I've spoken to them about this before. And if you ever took our way old, our membership class, we see the details of how our church was formed. We see that between Pastor Joe and Miss Lynn, they did not have all the details of what it would take to start a church in Middletown, New York. They did not have an exact 50-year game plan for what the next years would hold in Middletown, New York. They did not have a guarantee that everything would be okay throughout this process. They did not have the exact staff that they needed to start a church. They did not have the right home at the time. They didn't have the worship leader. They did not have the finances. They did not have the building. There's a whole lot of things that they did not have in starting this church. But you know what they did have? They had faith. And everyone, I want you to grab the seat that you're sitting on. Just go ahead, pinch the seat real quick. You're sitting in a seat today because of their faith. We're hearing this sermon today because two people decided to place their faith in the word of God. Your lives are being impacted because two people decided to place their faith in the word of God. I get to stand on this stage 40 years later. It's been over 40 years. I was not alive 40 years ago. Newsflash. I get to preach a sermon today on a stage based off the faith of two people. Do you see how faith is the underlying principle of Christianity? If you have ever been impacted by this ministry in the slightest, you are a living testimony of what faith in God can do. I want to encourage you today, if you want to live a meaningful life, if you want to leave a legacy, that it begins with placing your faith in Jesus Christ. And let's be for real today. It's a lot easier said than done. It is way easier to talk about having faith in God than to live out that faith when moments get difficult. Maybe life has been very difficult for you recently. And you're asking God, where are you in the midst of these trials? Is there an area of life where you've lost faith in God? You know what the preacher says, that you're supposed to have faith no matter what, but yeah. What about when I'm alone on a Wednesday night and I'm not at a church service? My prayer this morning is that if you've walked in here and you feel like you've lost your faith in God, that today would kind of be like a jump start. I believe that many times we lose faith in God, not because he's not faithful, not because we don't believe in him, but because we're facing a situation that's difficult. That we lose faith because of the storms of life that are standing in front of us. There's a story in Mark chapter 4 where Jesus tells his disciples, he's like, let's get in the boat and cross to the other side. He says, let's cross to the other side. And he was preaching, so he wanted to take a nap. Like, after church, I'm taking a nap today. I'd be tired sometimes after I preach. He's in this boat, and he's taking a nap, but a storm begins. And the Bible says that the wind and waves get going, and that water begins to fill the boat. And they wake up Jesus from his nap, and they say, Jesus, do you not care that we are perishing? Jesus, do you not care that we are dying? And he wakes up, he calms the storm, and you know what he says to them? Do you still have no faith? Why could Jesus in this moment challenge their lack of faith? Because he spoke a word that said, let us cross to the other side. By virtue of God speaking that word, it was a guarantee that they would make it there. It didn't matter what the storm said. It didn't matter what the wind said. By virtue of the word that Jesus spoke, they were guaranteed to make it to the other side. Yeah, but Pastor Josh... 
They were faithless in that moment. But who gave the word? Jesus. And the Bible says that even when we are faithless, that he is faithful. That he watches over his word to perform it. I say all that to say if you're in a storm today, don't quit. If you feel like you're drowning today, don't quit. You say, it feels like Jesus is sleeping. Yeah, but it doesn't mean he's left you. It doesn't mean he's abandoned you. By virtue of I can't hear, guess what? That is the excellent moment to exercise your faith. That is the perfect moment to trust in God. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, it says that faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. The word assurance there is the Greek word hypostasis, which it literally means the underlying. So faith is the underlying confidence or it is the underlying guarantee. So it's essentially saying that when we have faith, that whatever God says is ours is a guarantee. That when we hold on to faith, that when we act in our faith, that the things that God spoke, that we don't have to be ashamed of it. That we don't need to be nervous about God holding up his end of the deal. As long as you have faith, the unseen is a guarantee. Why is that? Because faith is the underlying principle of Christianity. If I said, what does it mean to be a Christian? You might say, well, I got to stop the bad behaviors, and I only got to curse up my kids once a day instead of four times because I love Jesus now. Um, I got to pay my tithes. I got to be respectful. And we talk about all these ideas of what it means to be a Christian, and we forget about Christ, the underlying principle. We forget about the foundation. If we're being truly honest, to try to take someone who is not a Christian and make them act like a Christian without giving them Christ is foolish. It is foolish. Why would you expect the world to act like you when they don't know the God that you know? For real. But here's the thing. When you start with Christ... Everything else will follow. When you start with Jesus, everything else will follow. For being real, you start with the actions, you're, you're in the Pharisee squad. We're in the Pharisee squad at that point. We're placing the actions before the underlying principle. It's easy to think that we can't be a, a great person of faith because we've messed up. It's so easy to hear a message on faith and compare yourself to the Bible character and you say, I can never do that. I can never see a, a, a sea crossed on dry land like Moses did. We're so focused on our abilities and what we're capable of, we forget that faith isn't about what we can do. It's about what he can do. Faith is all about God's ability. I can't be a person of faith. I messed up. Girl, read your Bible. I'm going to read you some highlights from the lives of the people in the hall of faith in Hebrews chapter 11. They were not always the strongest or the wisest or the obvious choice according to man's standard. These people cried. They had attitudes with God. They ran from God. They doubted God. They were scared. They sinned. They murdered, they committed adultery, they plotted, they did takeovers. One of them went to Egypt, and a king sees his wife. And the king says, wow, she's beautiful. I want her. You know what my boy says? He says, that's my sister. He says, you can have her. He gives over his wife like that. We see all these mistakes that these people in Hebrews 11 made. Yet, they're not defined by their mistakes. They're defined by their faith in God. Yeah. 
today, I don't want to hear about how your mistakes disqualify you from being used by God. I don't want to hear how your sins stop you from being used by God. I don't want to hear how your issues stop you from being used by God. I want to say, join the club. Welcome to the club. Our actions, the living, it will follow. The most important thing is that we start by placing our faith in God. It's not our ability to behave correctly that moves God. If that was the case, Jesus would have been like, Pharisees, come on. What's up, my dogs? It is the ability to place our faith in him that moves the heart of God. If you're the person that's here today and you said, I've messed up, I've messed up, I've messed up, therefore God can't use me. I want to encourage you to let your faith be stirred and be amazed at what God can do in your life. As we keep reading through Hebrews, we see this beautiful picture of all these people of faith. And then the author writes this little note at the end. We don't know who the author is. Hebrews is in the Bible because of the quality of the writing. It says in verse 39, yet all these giants of faith, all these people we just talked about, though they are praised or commended for their faith, they did not receive what was promised. Since God has provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. In other words, he praises their huge faith and then he says to us, but we actually got to see the underlying principle. We got to see the logos. We got to see the word made flesh. Verse in chapter 12, he says, therefore, because of all of this, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, all these people, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that clings to us so closely. And let us run. Everybody say run. Run with perseverance the race that is set before us. This word for running the race, it's not a sprint. It's not like it's Sunday. And we're like, all right, Jesus, I got you till tonight. And then Monday through Saturday, I'm going to turn up. I'm going to go wild, right? It's saying run with endurance like a distance runner. It's saying that faith is a lifelong journey. Faith is not a sprint. It's a marathon. And I want to ask you today, what weights are you wearing that are, you feel are weighing down your faith journey? Are you carrying a weight of unbelief? Are you carrying a weight of depression? Are you carrying a weight where you're just afraid, you're too afraid to trust God? Are you carrying, this is a big weight, control of the future? Where God says, go to a land that I will, you say, ah, you're good. You ain't got to say no more. I've heard enough. You can stop talking to me. I want to encourage you today. It's time to put down those weights. It's time to take off those weights that are weighing us down and look forward to Jesus. Verse 2, he says, take off the weights, run with endurance, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and the perfecter of our faith. In other words, he is the author and the finisher of our faith. And listen to the example that is used to show us faith. Who for the sake of the joy set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and he has taken a seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Look to Jesus, the beginning and the end of our faith. He says, look at the underlying principle of all of creation, and he is the perfect image of faith in God. The example that he uses for faith is actually kind of scary. It's not the example of a king in a castle. It's the example of a king on a cross. He's saying that is the image of faith, to lay down your life before God, to say, here's all that I am, for all that you are, God. Jesus lays down his life as an example to us. 
He could have just stayed in heaven, but even though he's the foundation of all that exists, he steps into his creation and shows us what it is to live by faith. It's why the Apostle Paul can say, I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I want to encourage you today with a simple question. What is the underlying principle of your life? Really ask yourself this week, what do I place my trust in the most? Where have I placed my confidence? Is it in my ability? Is it in somebody else? I simply want to encourage you today that there is no greater foundation for your life than Jesus Christ. There is no greater foundation, there is no greater underlying principle for your life other than Jesus. And no matter what your background is, there are some people in this room that might be politicians. There might be people who work at a, at, um, at a grocery store. There might be people who work at a church. There might be people who are operating cameras. There might be people who are Uber drivers. It doesn't matter what you are doing. What matters is that everything that we do, we can do unto God when we make him the foundation of our lives. So I want to encourage you today, don't quit. Don't quit. Look at someone next to you, tell them, don't quit. Look at your backup choice, other person, and tell them, don't quit. <laughs> this journey, this race with God, this race that we run with endurance, we have an opportunity to place our faith in God along the ride. And it is in those moments when we feel like quitting that we ought to lean into him even more. Let's pray today. Father, we come to you today in Jesus' name. And Father, I thank you today that faith is rising in this room. Lord, I pray for anyone that is in the middle of a storm, anyone who is in a difficult moment where they are ready to give up on you, God. I pray right now in the name of Jesus that they'd be reminded that you are right there with them in the boat. That you are holding things together. That it is you on which we can build our lives. I pray, Holy Spirit, if there's anyone in this room who is losing faith, who needs someone to connect with God, that you would supernaturally, that you would be faithful over your word and provide exactly what we need today. I thank you for these things. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And today I want to pray a second prayer. This is known as the prayer of salvation. For anyone who hasn't yet placed their faith in Jesus, I want to give you an opportunity today. We all pray this prayer together. Repeat after me. Say, dear God, I come to you today just like I am. I believe that Jesus Christ is my Lord and my Savior. Jesus, I believe that you died and rose for me. Come into my heart come into my life to change me and make me new. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thanks for watching today's message. My name is Pastor John Mark, and if this message has made an impact in your life in any way, I'd like to ask you to do a couple of things. We want you to like and subscribe to our channel and join us right here every Sunday at 9.30 a.m. or 11.30 a.m. The next thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to take your next step in your journey. We'd love to help you do that. And you can head over to FamilyChurchNY.com or email us at team at FamilyChurchNY.com to get started 